welcome back everybody to another episode of the nonprofit show i'm julia patrick ceo of the american nonprofit academy joined today by the masterful mr nonprofit consultancy himself tony bell welcome back my friend well thank you so much happy friday i can't believe another week has gone by i probably say that every week but time just goes by so quickly right time flies when you're having fun <laughs> you know tony it's uh it's shocking. I don't know how you structure your life. I work, you know, I have like my calendar, like everyone else and yada, yada, yada. And then it fills up. Other people put things on their calendar. And every night before I go to bed, the last thing I do is I open up my phone, look at my calendar and kind of set what the day is going to be like. And uh, last night I was like, what? Tomorrow's Friday. <laughs> I mean, I was like, I was so shocked, you know, that all this week had passed. And uh, so I agree with you. It's, it's kind of crazy. You know, today we're going to be talking about donor portfolio management tips and tricks. And um, I just feel like this is one of those rarefied, mysterious topics in the fundraiser um, work environment. Nobody seems to do it the same. And it's just such an interesting aspect. And so I can't wait to really dig into this with you and have you help us understand this. Another thing that we want to make sure we, we dig into are our sponsors. And they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Your Part-Time Controller, Fundraisers Friday, which is today, and 180 Management Group. These are the folks that join us day in and day out. Again, I'm Julia Patrick with Tony Bell, one of um, our amazing co-hosts. We have this really diverse panel. They come from all over the country. They're super interesting people. And um, Tony's a little special because he gets his own show, but I'm just going to say. <laughs> I'm so honored. But it is, it's such a, we've talked about this too, that such an incredible cohort of folks to to join the nonprofit show and and share their perspective and and their learned experience and and everyone has kind of a specialty I believe yes. uh, amongst this group so uh, so congratulations to you and and huge thanks to them for all the work that they do to continue to lift up the sector and and do great things for the causes they support. Yeah, it, you couldn't have said that more beautifully because um, they are one of the things i find fascinating is that they're geographically diverse right so you know they they come at things within our sector that you would think oh there's one answer for that and that's mm -hmm. just not the case i think mm -hmm. you know you and i explore that every week and uh so that's what i just love about this uh, cohort they are fascinating fascinating people okay my friend we got to dig into this because there's a lot to, to talk about and the first place is, and maybe we should back the bus up, what is a donor portfolio? And then what should we think about in terms of the average number of donors in that portfolio? What say you? What say me? Yeah, I think that that's, that's a great question. And you're right. I mean, I think backing up a little bit, uh, just to talk about the, the value of of donor portfolios and and why they're in, they're important uh and we'll talk even deeper about that i think you know later on in the conversation but uh you know ideally you're you're investing in some type of technology that allows you to easily document interactions with donors and investors for your cause and those interactions include many things uh, and you can define them within your own organization uh, so that it supports the way in which you do business. Uh, but primarily, you know, they would include any type of communication, of course, any type of gift or gift history, uh, personalized information around birthdays, anniversaries, uh, hobbies. Uh, so it really is uh, quite simply put data and data that you will refer to often as you continue to build and sustain relationships with uh, with your donors. So once you've done all of it, it allows you to help kind of segment your donors. Uh, and that I think is really the answer to this kind of question around what is the average number of donors in a portfolio. Uh, I think it depends on the rock stars that are on your development team. 
uh, yeah. and what they can handle. Uh, yeah. But my initial response is really the donor portfolio should be based on segments of donors. And one of those segments may be gift level. So your higher gift level individuals, you would want that portfolio to be smaller than a portfolio of lower gift uh, individuals. And, uh, and the reason why I say that is because of the relationship uh, maintenance or opportunities okay. uh, that exist with higher level donors. Uh, I think that they, uh, they require more time in order to make sure that they continue to support you at those levels or higher levels. Uh, it doesn't mean that, that lower level donors aren't equally as important as we hope to increase their level of commitment to the organization, but I think that there are different strategies and require different levels of time commitment. Okay, so Tony, one of the things that you taught me early on, I and mean, when I first met you, uh, before you you were even a guest on the nonprofit show, you really illuminated the aspect of relationships, and that this is a cultivation of a relationship. So let me throw this question to you because recently um, I I had this discussion with somebody, and it was that in their donor portfolio they had stratified it by gift level and by programming which so mm -hmm. i get that because it's a it was a large it's it is a larger organization but then in that this development officer had really good like old school ties to some of these old school families in our state and she was was saying to her team these are my people and it had an ethnic component too OK, and so she was like, I should be taking the this family or these you know families because they're my people. And I think that they're going to be more comfortable with me and they're going to be you know, it's, it's going to be better to build that relationship. And I thought it was really fascinating because it was a human, uh, a human condition and a human situation. And I'm wondering about that, like. How often do folks shift from portfolio to portfolio because maybe it's not a good fit or it's a better fit or, you know, it's like the human side of it. Or should we just really stick to the, the stratification and our, our levels? That I, I love that you brought that up. And, and yes, it is all about relationships. And, and so when we talk about segmentation, that could be defined in, in many different ways okay. and uh, and can be done in many different levels. So perhaps the initial segmentation is based on giving and giving history. Well, then there could be another level around, you know, geography or, mm -hmm. you know, a deeper dive into demographic uh, mm -hmm. so that we can make sure that we are aligning uh, our fundraising professionals with individuals where we're ultimately going to see the highest level of success for the donor experience. Yeah. Uh, Cause that's really at the end of the day, what it's all about. I hate it when I say end of the day, but that's, I mean, it really is what it's all about. <laughs> I, do, I hate it when I say end of the day, but that's really <laughs> what it's all about is the relationships and the donor experience. Um, so I would support, you know, that conversation uh, that, you know, a certain, number of, of donors or potential investors may relate more with me than they may another individual um, on our, you know, on our team. Yeah. So, so when we look at that segmentation based on, on gift level, you know, that might just be tier one of, of kind of the first segmentation. And then there are other tiers that we're going to take a look at uh, to make sure that we are individualizing the uh, the uh, opportunity and uh, and the experience. So I just uh, before we go on, I just had dinner with um, a, a development director who uh, I have tremendous respect for. Came from higher education, has moved into um, an organization that does really great work, but different and completely different group. Leading a team of five, bringing in a sixth person, and they did not have until she got there, donor portfolios. They were kind of a little bit all over 
you know, and, and just kind of work in their lists, but they didn't, they hadn't really created a plan. And um, I was shocked because I thought everybody would have this, right? And she said, yeah, I, I was shocked too. I just thought that this was a natural thing that I would come into. So my question to you before we go on to the next piece of this is like, is everybody using a portfolio system or like only 50%? I mean, what do you, what do you sense? Cause I know this is a hard thing to know, but what does your experience tell you? Yeah. So my experience tells me that uh, in higher ed, there are definitely portfolios that are, are being distributed amongst advancement yeah. teams. Uh, I, I think, I, I think when we talk about portfolios, we think of them in terms of a way in which to dis, you know, distribute uh, some of the work uh, and and some of the relationship uh, management. Uh, for smaller organizations, I think portfolios are still important, uh, but they're not creating those portfolios as a means to kind of distribute <laughs> some of you know some of the the work and the relationship management. Uh, mm -hmm. So I would say smaller to medium size, I see less kind of portfolio yeah. management than I do in larger nonprofits and certainly within higher uh, education. Uh, the other thing I'd say real quickly, Julia, as we talked about, you know, we, cre we create these portfolios and now who within our team, if we have a larger team, is best suited to create the best possible experience for the donors within that portfolio. Uh, I'm a huge, you know, fan of, uh, you know, taking a look at, at what we do with donors in terms of creating personas sometimes and creating personas within our organization. Mm -hmm. So when I look at Tony as a fundraising professional and development officer, what is his persona? What are the the qualities that he brings to the work that are best suited for some of the uh, folks that are within our portfolios. Mm -hmm. So looking at like even creating personas for ourselves mm -hmm. as fundraising individuals uh, to help us really kind of identify which yeah. donors are best suited for us to serve. Yeah, I I'm glad you brought that up because that seemed like before the pandemic, we were really moving into that concept and really kind of talking about it more and then it's kind of somewhat lagged but i agree with you i think it um it, it kind of can help galvanize an a, a fund development team and so they can understand all the different pieces that, that are going on let's get on to this next topic because you mentioned this early and i feel like this is one of those things that we're hearing more and more about i mean our great partner here educational partner bloomerang um, this is one of those things that they are um, investing in and, and this is what they provide. And they've, they've just as a company grown and grown and grown and, and added so many other types of technology companies into their system. But how do we look at this uh, role of investing in technology? Because I got to be honest with you, I feel like sometimes this helps the nonprofit silo things. So like if you're a volunteer coordinator, you'll be like, yeah, I, I, I'm not interested in what the fund development people are doing. Right. And I need a different software. And, you know, it, it seems like they don't always talk. <laughs> you know, the, the different departments don't always talk. And I don't know about you, but I hear that a lot. Yeah. Well, well one is I love how you position this because it really is an investment. Mm -hmm. Right. It's it's not it's. Yeah. you're going to see a return on this investment. Uh, so when a lot of organizations, and, and I say a lot still meaning small to medium-sized organizations whose budgets are tight to begin with, uh, so they struggle with the allocation uh, of this type of investment, but it's just important to remind them and everyone that technology is truly an investment. Uh, it's as important as anything else when it comes to fulfilling your mission and uh, and fulfilling your promise to the communities that you're you're serving. 
The other great thing about technology and where we are today and where we where I mean, just, you know, what's happening moving forward is a lot of platforms, Bloomerang being one of them, uh, that offer such diversity within the products that they're offering to the nonprofit sector. So with, you know, you can have a, a technology platform that allows you to do donor segmentation. So it serves as a donor management tool. It allows you to track volunteers. It allows you to create social media. It allows you to do e-blasts and emails and marketing. So um, so really it's, it, it's super important. And I know we're gonna talk a little bit in another slide you know, about this and, and other things that technology support, uh, but it truly is an investment. Uh, I understand why some organizations are using spreadsheets uh, because it's kind of where they are right now. Yeah. Uh, I would say though that technology uh, is a great investment when you use it and when you use it well. Uh, so that includes training and making sure that everyone really understands all the bells and whistles <laughs> and, yeah. and all of the value that it can bring. So uh, it's like any other subscription. Uh, it's only as good as, as your ability to know it, understand it and use it. Uh, but uh, a spreadsheet's better than nothing because data is important. And, and the technology is certainly a way to help capture the data. I love that you said that because I think that that's one of the things is that folks get all excited. Um, they think this is going to make their lives easier and then they disengage if they don't understand it or they don't get what they're thinking that they're going to get. And then they never pursue that training or they never stop, pull back and say, okay, how do, how does this work? And so I think that was magical thinking on your part because, um, also, these companies, these tech companies evolve, right? I mean, the product that you buy, you know, in January is not going to be the same product in June. It's chances are it's going to be a heck of a lot better. But you, you got to keep on that journey with them so that you can learn and add and, and explore even more opportunities. And, and there are, you know, thankfully, uh, there are more capacity building grants out there uh, mm -hmm. for nonprofits, again, especially small to medium nonprofits, yeah. to give them kind of that initial seed money to be able to invest mm -hmm. uh, in, in these platforms. So uh, be creative and, you know, and in, in some of your funding sources and look specifically for those if it, if it truly is a budgeting issue. Yeah, I, I appreciate you uh, highlighting that because that's very, very true. And, and again, it's one of those things we don't talk about. Well, let's go on to the next thing about uh, portfolio management, and that's succession planning. Now, who would ever think of putting succession planning in with this discussion? But I'm fascinated. I mean, you mentioned this in the green room. We talk about this all the time. AFP saying 16 to 19 months is the average tenure of a professional fundraiser. We got to be talking about succession planning. Bottom line. Bottom line. So again, you know, uh, if, if you're able to invest in technology to, to build out portfolio, uh, portfolios for your donors, or if you, if you are in that space where, you know, you're managing things on a spreadsheet, that collection of data and history is so important when we think about succession planning. And again, you know, that kind of what we're seeing as, as the quick turnover in a lot of development roles if I'm new coming into an organization uh, to serve as a development officer or development director or, or whatever your job title is, responsibility for fundraising, having that historical data is going to be really important for me to be able to kind of take the torch and carry it forward for the organization. So having, you know, names and, and giving history and contact information all of that is so important mm -hmm. uh, so that we uh, we understand again who historically and currently you know are investing in our in our mission so I think it's it's really critical um, this, you know data collection uh, mm -hmm. in, in terms of, of succession planning yeah it's really an interesting thing it's it's kind of like that 
conversation that we always, well, I shouldn't say we always, but we're really having now about next gen leadership. Who's up? Who's on the bench? Right. You know, you don't take to the field on any sport and not have great players behind you ready to jump in for whatever reason. Right. Mm -hmm. And so how do we manifest that same approach with our fundraising and development team um, so that if something happens, we're ready to go with whomever comes in. And mm -hmm. I think this is this is something we don't talk enough about. We talk about it with the, the C-suite or maybe just the top five people of an organization if they're larger but just really understanding this piece, I think is a huge, huge thing. And uh, well, I remember serving in an executive director role uh, with an organization here in South Florida and executive director was the title. I was it, I was the person <laughs> for this, for this association. All right. So, uh, but the title was executive director. I loved the job. I was there, you know, three and a half years, great people, uh, really enjoyed it. Uh, we didn't, other than a spreadsheet, uh, and there weren't many other options then, quite yeah. frankly, but you know, sure. but but there was a lot of information that was always tracked in, in a spreadsheet. Uh, but I remember the board thinking, he loves this job so much, he'll never go anywhere. So we don't ever need to worry about, you know, organizational history because he's got it or intellectual property because he's got it and he's never going anywhere until he got a really great offer and was recruited to join another organization. And then he resigned and left. Yeah. So that's just, you know, again, that was an example of why this is so important and why board members need to be reminded that regardless of how much someone loves the workplace, um, there are minimal opportunities for growth within the organizations that we typically work for, and folks are going to be open and embrace other opportunities, regardless of how much they might love the place that they're currently uh, serving. Right. I love that you said that. I think that's, that's really, uh, that's a powerful, powerful lesson. And I think it's, um, it's kind of one of those things that, uh, especially in today's labor market, where we don't just have people lined up at the back door taking jobs, that we have to really cultivate and retain, you know, work, cultivate with the spirit of retention. And, mm -hmm. uh, and looking at this, I think it's a really an interesting aspect. And so I'm delighted that you, you brought that up. We don't have much time left, but we definitely want to move on to reporting. And this is something that um, I wanted to bring up because I, I had a really interesting situation uh, working with some development uh, officers. They got a new development director and it's a sizable organization, sizable organization. I would say it's closer to an institutional sized organization. And the new development director said, OK, team, um, using our technology, using this, this software that we have, we're going to start reporting on your portfolio activity. And when we meet as a team, we're going to lay that out on the table and everybody's going to see what you're doing. And it freaked out the team. Um, it got them so upset that one person came to me and said, I'm going to, I'm going to leave. I'm going to retire early. And um, because they felt it like it was punitive and they felt like it was, quote unquote, you know, lifting their skirts and showing what was underneath. Right. Versus saying it within the spirit of the team and growth and all this, what was going on. And this is a successful fundraising organization. That was, I think, the most interesting aspect for me is that it wasn't a, a failing organization. Right. It was somebody it was a group that should have had good, good reports, I guess, if you will. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm curious as to what you think about this. You know, should it be this information just be between the the development officer and the development director? I mean, how does this ecosystem work? Yeah, so we've talked many times about fundraising is a team sport. Yeah. So I think the more the team knows, uh, the better all of us are in terms of of performing. Uh, I think you said something really important, and that is 
that this is a shift in culture for the organization uh, in terms of, of reporting. And, and it's really important that there is not a, cult you know, a culture where individuals feel like it is punitive when this information is shared with others. Really, it should be shared in the spirit of, you know, we all rise, right? So lifting everybody up. Uh, and I've certainly seen that, and, and even within the organization uh, that I recently served, uh, this information was transparent. We met monthly and goal individual goals were shared, but it was a culture of how do I support that individual that is not meeting the goal? How can I help them overcome whatever hurdles they may be experiencing? What do I know that I can potentially share with them in a total uplifting way <laughs> to help get them to goal. Uh, so I think there's a lot of value in, in being super transparent and sharing it with the team. Uh, again, as long as we've created that culture where it is seen as a, uh, a method to support one another and not necessarily to make individuals feel bad about yeah. themselves or or the work that you know or the work that they're doing uh, and others would argue that there's you know there's nothing wrong with creating a little bit of a competitive spirit you know um, amongst the team uh, but i think that you can be competitive and award folks for performing without diminishing the value of others mm -hmm. uh, so that's what I would say. Uh, but yes, definitely there has to be reporting uh, because you you need to report results to the board, um, to the CEO. I mean, the CEO is going to be curious about individual performance. Uh, if it looks like the department as a whole is not going to meet meet goal, then kind of where are we missing? You know, opportunities to meet goal. Uh, so I think reporting is 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 really important. Whether it's it's done in the way in which you shared, which I agree with. Uh, or if it's a dashboard where we are all kind of individually contributing to a dashboard and then everyone's just kind of saying kind of the sum of the parts. Mm -hmm. uh, but reporting is is important. Uh, it's the only way we can kind of measure our success and and where we are in, in terms of meeting OKRs, uh, you know, for the organization. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's it's interesting that you would frame it that way, because in a, a future episode, which is coming up in the next couple of weeks. I can't remember which date, but um, we're going to be talking about how to prepare for your annual review. And th this is for fundraisers, right? Like if you're sitting in that hot seat, what do you do to show your worth and, and value? Because again, you work and work and work and some of these things might not pan out for quite a while, right? And so how do you how do you track that? So I think this kind of fits into that, that conversation. I also think that this, you know, follows the sell word. You know, if you and I were selling shoes or widgets or hats or submarines, we would have these metrics, right? We would have these reports. And hello, we are selling in the nonprofit sector. I know it's so unpopular to say I know you use the word cause selling and, you know, there, we, we try to temper the opinion of what we all, a lot of us have about selling, but at the end of the day, these reports are really, really critical. Also, I think there's something to celebrate. Oh, for sure. Well, I, I think that that's really important. We have to celebrate all the little small steps along the way, right? You know, before, you know, before we have the, the big celebrations. Uh, and, and again, when, when we use selling and sales in our conversation in nonprofit, it really is more specific to a process and a strategy, right? So when we talk about sales, yes, we're selling. What are we selling? We're selling a solution to a community need. That's yeah. what we're selling. Uh, but, but, it really is all about the process in which we do the work. And a lot of the successful process mirrors what would take place in a for-profit sales environment. Exactly. I love it. Well, once again, you are the man, um, Tony Bell, Mr. Nonprofit Consultancy, joining us on Fundraisers Friday. 
a really great episode we have each Friday just dedicated to fundraising. And so it's really, I just think, such an exciting thing. I really look forward to it. Um, if Even if it wasn't on a Friday, Tony, even if it wasn't on a Friday, I got to say, hey, another thing that we want to make sure that we show our appreciation uh, towards are our sponsors. And they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Your Part-Time Controller, Fundraisers Friday, and 180 Management Group. These are the folks that join us day in and day out. Tony, have a great weekend. Next week is going to be super busy. Um, and so I look forward to reconnecting with you and uh, rest up, my friend. You do the same, Julia. Thank you so much for the opportunity. It's have a great a weekend. Of, oh, thank you. It's been a lot of fun. You know, we end every episode of the nonprofit show with this message. Going into a weekend, I think it's a, a good message. And that is to stay well so you can do well. Thanks, everybody.